the one thing that we were told growing up is you never talk about sex, politics, or religion in polite company. You don't do it. And weirdly, population kind of typically touches upon all three and a few more. Sex, religion, and politics. No wonder this podcast is so exciting. Those are the words of Christopher Tucker, author of A Planet of Three Billion, mapping humanity's long history of ecological destruction and finding our way to a resilient future. We'll continue our conversation with Chris next on the Overpopulation Podcast. Welcome to the Overpopulation Podcast, the podcast exploring the most important decision we make in our lives, choosing a bleak or a beautiful future. I'm your co-host, Dave Gardner, Executive Director of World Population Balance. And I'm Nandita Bajaj, co-host of the Overpopulation Podcast. If you're new to this subject or just otherwise interested in learning more, there's a wealth of information on our website, worldpopulationbalance.org. Dave, do we have anything interesting in the inbox today? As a matter of fact, yes, we do. You know, our last episode generated the email that I'd like to share today. It's from Robert in Santa Barbara, California. And he wrote this email about that episode of the podcast, which was part one of our conversation with Chris Tucker. Just wanted to compliment you on the exquisite podcast, episode 57, How Many of Us Can Earth Support? You made this depressing topic not only entertaining, but even sprinkled with hilarity, which was a pleasant surprise. Great job. Looking forward to episode 58. Oh, and more kudos to Chris on his A Planet of Three Billion. I finished it a couple of weeks ago and have been spewing knowledgeable factoids ever since to whoever would listen, whether they wanted to or not. Thanks again for writing it. You know, this is a, another email from a, you know, a somewhat famous person. That's Robert Johnson, and he is a, a Hollywood screenwriter and author of an interesting novel that's sitting on my bedside table right now called The Culling, which, as a matter of fact, is about human overpopulation. So uh, it's a little extra feather in our cap to get these complimentary words from a screenwriter, I think. Oh, I'd love to get a copy of that. Well, I think we can probably arrange that. I'll put a link in the show notes if I can. Oh, I'm going to read that on vacation because I insist on reading novels on vacation. Perfect. <laughs> perfect novel to read. It is a little bit work, but a little bit play. Uh, and then we'll be able to have him. Once we've read the novel, we should have him as a guest on the podcast, I think. Sounds great. Thanks, Robert, for writing to us. If you have any feedback or if there's a topic you would like us to address, write to us at podcast at worldpopulationbalance.org. Now, if you liked episode 57, you'll love this one. Our conversation continues with Chris Tucker, author of A Planet of Three Billion. Just a quick reminder, Christopher Tucker is chairman of the American Geographical Society and a strategic advisor to the U.S. national security community. He holds three degrees, a BA, MA, and PhD from Columbia University, and he serves on a number of boards, including the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation and the Open Geospatial Consortium. Wow. With a resume like that, you'd think he might be a geek. But if you listened to our last episode, and you should, link in the show notes, you know Chris brings a lot of energy, knowledge, and optimism to the subject we call overpopulation. In part two of our conversation, we discuss the taboo on discussing overpopulation, or runaway population growth as Chris likes to call it. Chris and Dave also take on neoclassical economists and journalists, and we discuss his solution to the human overpopulation crisis. Let's get to it. So uh, what I was going back to from the previous episode was this conversation about the choice between bad versus worse. And um, currently, I think you spoke to it a little bit earlier, how the bad choice here for us is the difficulty in being able to talk about overpopulation. Uh, There is a lot of denial. You know, you even mentioned population policy. It's a difficult word to talk about. Because uh, people automatically jump to one child policy in China. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Exploitative policies that have taken advantage of the most disenfranchised people. Right. But that's not where we are now. And the worst of the choice out of the two is the predicament we'll put ourselves in if we don't talk about it now. That's right. So. Where am I going with this? (laughs) Well, do you mind if I throw something out there? I mean, I grew up in the American South in the 70s and 80s. 
sweet tea, lots of church. Yeah, everybody's polite. And one thing that we were told growing up is you never talk about sex, politics, or religion in polite company. You don't do it. And weirdly, population kind of typically touches upon all three and a few more. So the notion that like where I grew up, I mean, they're not ignoring population. They're ignoring uncomfortable conversations, you know, and and that's just one of a long list of things they're not talking about because it's just you don't talk about polite company. And so, you know, I think a lot of the ignoring population isn't ignoring population. It's ignoring uncomfortable things in general. And I think part of it is how it was framed, you know, mid-century, how it was framed in the 70s. And then with kind of the, um, I'd call it the more progressive folks in later years are like, wait a minute, you know, like, I don't want to tell people on the other side of the world who I respect, you know, I respect their culture. I don't want to tell them what they must do. Who am I to tell them that? So I feel like the discomfort has actually spanned you know, the political spectrum in weird sorts of ways. And each country, like the debate in England is different from the U.S., different from where it is in India, different from what it is in different East Asian countries in South America. Mm -hmm. So I would say what's common is that there is a taboo, but the nature of the taboo is actually a little bit different in each place. So, yeah, I agree, right? The, if we're choosing between bad and worse right now, the bad thing we have to do is engage in an uncomfortable conversation. Oh, no. Uh, guess what? It's either that uncomfortable conversation or a much more uncomfortable conversation coming very soon. And so when I phrase it that way, people go, I'll choose bad over worse anytime. OK, let's have the conversation. <laughs> and, and that's that's how I just like to frame it. And, and then the good news, you know, I often have this slide in my talk that is a black and white outline of Rosie the Riveter with her arm flexed. And they put that up and immediately the tone in the room changes because I've just been telling them about how humanity is destroying the planet. And I put up Rosie the Riveter and they're all like, wait, is there good news coming? Like what? <laughs> and and I point out, you know, then every geography where women are empowered, educated, integrated in the workforce and have access to family planning technologies in genuine ways, you have below replacement value fertility. All of a sudden I start getting like, you know, clapping and whistling and yeehawing from not only the women in the room, but the men also. And so I think part of the debate is it's such a burden in so many ways, um, and it's such a bummer, it's such a downer, and it's so impolite in historical frame that, you know, the more we front end the discussion around empowerment of women and girls, particularly now, maybe in 2020, it wasn't, we weren't as awoken to those set of issues. But I think right now, humanity's ready for that. Um, and it couldn't be a second earlier or later because we'd be completely screwed. So to me, like I like to front end the conversation of I would like to avoid ecological annihilation of our planet through the empowerment of women and girls. And everybody's like, what's the connection? Can you walk me through that? And then you just immediately go in there. And so increasingly, I'm finding that in my popular discussions, I may ask the question, how many people can the earth support? And I may tell, me, tell that, but I don't dwell on runaway population growth as much in my personal discussions, though I think the term runaway is critically important for people to understand. Instead, you know, what I'm really trying to get people to focus on is the importance of small, educated, and prosperous families. If you are able to, fortunate enough to build a small, educated family, it's more likely to be prosperous. And the more, <laughs> the smaller, the more educated and prosperous family are, the smaller they are. Um, the smaller they are, the more likely you can afford education. It's just this virtuous circle. And I think there's a lot of attention being paid to this, including places like the Catholic Church that historically you may say, that's not how they're thinking. But People appreciate that small, educated, prosperous families will be able to commit to deliberate action about the well-being of their community and their planet. And large families that are uneducated, that aren't prosperous, they don't have the control over their fate. They don't have the control over their ability to make deliberate decisions about what their impact will be on the planet. But that fertility norm of those large families, you know, every culture's had it. America, we used to generate 11 kids per family in Minnesota, right? And that was only two generations ago. So the notion that it's a Western thing versus an Africa thing, it's that is simply not true. Anyone who says it is unaware of their own history. It's often just a, an agricultural thing versus an urban thing. And we all know that the inevitable trend now is towards urbanization all across the world. By 2050, more than 75% of the world population will be urban. 
And I think one of the biggest challenges we have is whenever people urbanize, the shift in the fertility norm often lags by one generation, right? So you had Italians that moved to New York City and they had a ton of kids for one generation. <laughs> the next generation like, yeah, that was crazy. I think I'll have four kids. And now they're having like one. And I'm not picking on Italians. I'm just picking an example from the United States, right? So when you look around the rest of the world, you have subsistence farmers that have large number of children because it's the norm. They don't have access to family planning. Women do not have any bodily autonomy, but also those children are essential to the well-being of their agricultural economy. And with progress, there's less infant mortality, so even fewer children die. But those families, many of them are going to move to a city, and in that next generation, they're probably going to have like seven to nine kids again. And if you can short circuit that one generation shift where you norm shift as people move into the cities, I think it is more than feasible to hit a 1.5 TFR by 2030 and completely reverse the kind of runaway, unmanageable trends that we have beyond population, carbon, ecological destruction, et cetera. Hey, Nandita, I think he can hear us talking about him, but I'm going to talk about him. Now. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking that as a sustainable population activist, I studied under Bill Maher and George Carlin. And I think Chris Tucker took the Dale Carnegie course. <laughs> Chris, Chris, <laughs> you know, you're really making good sense and, and saying it very well. So thank you for that. Okay. I'll take all that as a compliment. I'm not sure what to do with it. But, um, you know, look, people often ask me, they go, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? And I say, I'm, I'm neither. I'm a complete and utter opportunist. And it doesn't matter what part of my life it is, whether my business life or, you know, some nonprofit. I'm, every day is filled with opportunities. And it's my job to aggressively go after and seize those opportunities to advantage my family, my business, you know, whatever it is. Every single day, all of us have an opportunity that we can all individually seize that would bend the global population curve immediately and save our planet from annihilation every single day. But we treat these things as these inexorable, exogenous forces. Demographers always do. They go, I don't know, population's going to go kind of like this. It's just going to keep on going to 11 billion. Like, why are you treating it like it's an external force handed to you when it's just people making choices? And I believe that so many of the intellectual disciplines that have grappled with this issue have abdicated their moral responsibility to impress upon us our moral opportunity to deal with the biggest issues facing our planet and our species. It's an opportunity every day for everyone to actually solve this. Small changes to a complex system have profound impacts, right? Major changes can come from, instead of on average, choosing two to three kids, choosing one to two. We will be below 2.1 fertility rate, which is break-even fertility. And we're already at 2.45. It's not like we're at 12 and we've got to get to negative 12. We've got to go from 2.45 to below 2.1. And I would argue if we went to 1.5, right, less than a one-point change, we would be able to bring that curve down so quickly that we would really have a chance to work down that ecological debt rewild, do all the things we have to do to give our planet, our planet wants to bounce back, right? When you pull humans out of the equation, the planet does a remarkable job of bouncing back, but we have to give it a shot and be really thoughtful, strategic, and deliberate about it. Too true. Yeah. And the one thing I would add is um, overpopulation is obviously a problem, but as you already mentioned in the previous episode, it's not just about the numbers. It's also about how we're consuming. Oh, totally. So as you know, a lot of the work that we do here with World Population Balance is trying to raise awareness about our footprint here in industrialized countries. Absolutely. And that the overpopulation issue is not just something that's in developing countries. It's something that we're suffering from here in the U.S. and Canada. Yep. That's where I am. And that we're also trying to raise awareness about having smaller families here because of the disproportionately large footprint of a child born here versus a child right. born in a developing country. Right. And uh, I wonder if the P3B, the Planet 3 Billion campaign, um, talks about that, you know, the work of overpopulation activists in 
both developing and industrialized countries. Yeah, for sure. And I will never, ever diminish the problem of consumption. Certainly developed world's consumption patterns are ridiculous. And I resemble that remark. I mean, we do our best around this household. And I look around every day like, how can one family generate that much garbage? And we compost, we do everything. And it's still utterly ridiculous. But it's baked into the very fabric of our landscape and how we've designed our society. So you can either escape your entire society somehow, or you're somehow complicit in the consumption and waste model of your society. So it's tough, right? But I will say, I mean, the reason I focus, people say it's population and consumption, to which I say, you're absolutely right. But then there's a set of people that say, but we don't want to talk about population because that'll take the focus off consumption. And I'm like, um, okay, so does a family of nine in your country consume more or less than a family of two in your country? To which they go, got it. Sorry. <laughs> it's so easy to, and, and I, again, what is it? The developed world, you know, as an individual, like my carbon footprint's like 10 times worse than somebody in the developing world. I get it. And it's horrible. And we need to be taking strategic, thoughtful action on that. But to silence the population debate means that in every country, they could end up having five times worse. If you have a family of six instead of a family of two kids, right, that's three times bigger footprint, even though it's at your national scale. So we all have something to contribute on that. The other thing I like to point out is in the developing world, if you look at the trends between now and 2030, the billions of people that are moving into the global middle class, which is a great thing, right? We've invested, we're doing our best through trade and economic development, all these things, education, that's going to happen. What are their footprints going to look like? They're going to look increasingly mm-hmm. like ours. As Kishore Mabubani said, you know, in, in one of his books, he's like, you know, he grew up watching Americans on TV. He wanted everything they had on TV. So when he grew up in India, he's like, then he just started buying everything he saw on TV. So like, we have to think about that next generation in, in developing world that's going to join the global middle class and their consumption model. But guess what? We could also have fewer people every year if we just bent the fertility curve and reduce our consumption at the same time. And what I always like to point out is, even if the day we have one fewer person on the, on the planet, it won't solve our problem because of the amount of ecological debt that we've produced and the surplus debt we accumulate every year. So we actually have to be below $3 billion in order to work down that ecological debt. So we've got decades before we can even really get in front of the ecological destruction that we as a, as a society have created. Not sure if I answered your question. I just went on a rant there. No, no, I think we're in agreement with each other. I, was, I wasn't saying that we yeah, need yeah. to silence the For debate sure. on population yeah. to bring more emphasis on consumption. I'm saying we need to bring the debate on, not the debate, we don't actually need to have a debate. We need to bring the emphasis on population and consumption here yep. and everywhere. You know, I, I think, um, I don't know if you saw it back in uh, November of 2019, the Global Scientist Warning on Climate Change article in Bioscience. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I've seen, you may have seen it before, but they picked six things that humanity needs to do in order to avert climate catastrophe. And Mm -hmm. number six, for the first time, was stabilize world population and have it decrease in an orderly, ethical, you know, kind of way. And that was the first time I had really seen in the mainstream climate debate that it wasn't just about consumption. And they had consumption in there, right? Because you cannot get rid of consumption. But you put the two together. And so that gave me a lot of hope that I think now 14,000 scientists have signed on to that article. And so I'm waiting for kind of the mainstream climate action community to say, hey, they're right. 110% right on consumption and 110% right on population. And when the debate shifts in the climate action community around that, Um, I think it'll be great. It's already shifted in the conservation community. The IUCN passed a motion in the fall for rights-based family planning. The International Conservation Organization did that. So I I feel the momentum, but I think everybody has to keep a steady drumbeat to keep it going. Yeah, we still got some work to do because there's still a strong uh, effort to cancel the conversation. Yeah, yeah. there will be. So you mentioned in in the book that uh, neoclassical economists are (laughs) going to be one of the biggest roadblocks. Why is that? So my dissertation advisor, one of them was uh, an economist, but he was, I guess you'd call him a heterodox economist. He was about the evolutionary economics and uh, economics of technical change. 
And what I experienced with neoclassical economics, and I think it's well established, right, is so many of their concepts, particularly in macroeconomics, they are just baked in assumptions about population, right? You go, well, why do you have that accelerator? And you go, oh, well, you know, because like things just keep growing, right? Just put a population thing in there. I'm like, well, but isn't that malleable? And go, nope, nope, just put whatever they, I remember it used to be like in the 90s, just put 3% in there. I'm like, that's crazy. Like, why would we do that? Oh, shouldn't, isn't there a data table of actual population? Nope, just put in 3%, you're fine. And, but the entire thing was premised upon continuous annual growth. Yeah. And they recognized that population and technical change were two of the biggest things driving growth. And so when I really started grappling with this in the book, I felt the need to write a chapter on what I called uh, Reimagining Economics for an Era of Degrowth. And a lot of people call for degrowth. And I took a different approach. What I said was, you're going to have degrowth, whether it's in 2064, when we peak at 9.7 billion, or whether we bend the curve in 2030, the way I'm advocating, every year after that, there will be fewer people on the planet. The same way every year for many years, there's been fewer people in Japan. And Japan stopped really talking about GDP growth, which uh, neoclassical economics, it's got to be about GDP growth. They gave that up and they, they talk a lot more about per capita GDP growth, right? And it turns out Japan's doing great. I mean, you can have your criticism of Japan's economy or whatever, but compared to most of the world, Japan's doing great. And every year they're losing people from their population. So when people say it can't be, you know, uh, Stephen Chu, the former secretary of energy, actually called capitalism a Ponzi scheme. He quickly like <laughs> stopped talking about that. But um, it's like, look, if you predicate your economic model on continuous growth of human population, you're going to be sadly disappointed in 2064 or whenever when population peaks and starts declining. So, you know, we have to start thinking now we need a few decades to actually figure out how to run a prosperous global economy under continuous population decline. And the reason I say that is it actually took us, humanity, economists, economic policy people, decades to understand how to grow economies reliably. It did. I mean, in the face of communism, post-World War II, the capitalist, you know, the economists are trying to figure out how do I run a capitalist system that reliably delivers growth to developing economies of, around the world? If we can't do that, will fail in the face of communism. The cultural project was to achieve economic growth, never really understanding that there's only so much natural capital. And once you chew through your natural capital, you're screwed. That was not part of the debate. So I, my kind of straw man of what I think that reimagined economics looks like, and there's major key assumptions in neoclassical economics that just have to be jettisoned, fundamentally jettisoned. And I'm willing to go to the mat I'll arm wrestle any of those guys over that any day. Well, and we're already seeing rising amounts of alarmism and what I'm calling depopulation panic coming yeah. from those growth addicted economists. And yeah, but, but hold on. You know, where I'm going to say is I feel like it's I'll blame the journalists and their editors who took like one macroeconomic class in college and became a journalist. And all your assumptions are based on that. And the note, you know, so I would encourage journalists that are on the ecology beat and the climate beat and the developing world beat to jettison everything they learned in undergraduate macroeconomic class. There's some useful things in there. There's a conceptual toolbox that is useful to take the class. But um, they use that as the premise of their article. I remember that breathless article in the New York Times about Japan's population declining. And it was breathless. It was like, oh, my God. I'm like, dude, have you been to Japan? <laughs> have you been to Japan? Like, why are you so breathless? Well, let's definitely lump the journalists in there with the neoclassical economists. But the journalists have been programmed from birth to believe in the universal goodness of everlasting growth. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. Uh, you think all those journalists took undergraduate macroeconomics and I think their editors work for corporations. Um, and there's probably some truth in that, right? But I, honestly, I think there's a lot of people that are doing intellectually honest work in journalism around ecology, around climate change, whatever. They just don't know that the assumptions they were handed aren't helping them communicate the magnitude and the nature of the mm -hmm. threat to our species and our planet, even though that's what they're personally committed to. Well, we are all for your 2030 plan. I mean, that is, <laughs> thank you for articulating that, but I'm just anticipating that that's going to be one of the big hurdles in the trying to retard us from making that progress is that all of these growth addicted people, whether, whether it's just from all of the social conditioning that they've gotten from the prior generations of journalists or the economics 101 that they took in college, yeah. uh, you know, we've just got to deprogram all of them. Yeah. 
No, mm-hmm. and I, you know, it, I think the inspiration is going to come from unlikely places. My favorite quote recently, and I, I'm going to paraphrase it, was from Malala. The Malala Fund recently received some funding from the Apple Climate Initiative. And I was like, okay, wait a minute, like that can't be. But the Apple Climate Initiative recognized that the empowerment of women and girls, their education will reduce their total fertility and fewer people means lower carbon footprint. And I I was reading the article like this can't be. And then middle of the article was a quote from Malala that said that flat out. So maybe I don't need, you know, climate activists. Maybe I'm just going to listen to Malala from now on Uh, Mm because it turns out like she's dialed in on the heart of the issue. And places as prominent as Apple, right, Apple's climate initiative are investing in it. So, again, back to reprogramming kind of the foundations and how they think about this stuff. I think that they can and should go back to pairing discussions about responsible population dynamics with centering the health and well-being of women and girls in their programs, recognizing that it's a new day and a new debate from what the foundations funded 40, 50 years ago, right? And following the lead of the Apple Climate Initiative, follow what Malala tells you and invest your money that way. And if only that guy would call me back with the number of how much money needs to be invested in women and girls to empower them to to bend the global population curve. And again, you know, the empowerment of women and girls is a good in and of itself. It's a moral good in and of itself. It just also happens to be the thing that's actually going to keep us from annihilating our planet, which was, is good also. But if we have that number, I actually have no doubt that Apple in its spare bank account offshore has enough money to do this. That's how simple this could be. But we still have some homework to do. We still have some math to put in front of people. The last piece that I'd say is part of the homework that we also need to do is to maybe pull back from some of the population policies that are in place in our own governments that are doing more harm in, you know, funding baby bonuses and then, you know, sounding the alarm bells about depopulation. It's not just benign information that journalists are passing along. It's also governments are actively participating in in increasing our population, which, you know, is actually causing way more damage than some of the population control policies that have, you know, occurred in the past. But yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you with, you know, in terms of the empowerment messaging. No, I'm with you. I think there's a lot of benign, unintentional policy Uh, as you say, kind of Mm pro-natalist, but they are not even doing it for that reason. It's like, of course, I'm going to support people's kids, right? And then there's kind of non-benign stuff that there are authoritarian regimes that are treating women and children badly for the purpose of population control, focused on an ethnicity, focused on a, a political region. And we have to take that stuff seriously. So to wave it off, right? But to say that the only way to bend the global population curve is to embrace embrace the authoritarian or to you know have some sort of weird controls, I think is an idea of the past mm-hmm. that we have ample evidence that we don't need to embrace. And there are very attractive alternative sitting at our fingertips that if we just make the moral choice and be bold, I have no doubt in my mind we could bend the curve early and save our planet and our species from annihilation. Well, Chris, I was going to gripe at you a little bit, but boy, I, you haven't given me anything to gripe about in the last these last two episodes. Thank you. Well, there you. you go. Very well said. I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, I hope you might come back for a part three sometime this, this year, because I know Let's there's more we, more we talk about. Let's do it. You, you send me the invite and I'm here for you any day. Great. Thanks so much. Great to meet you. What a fantastic conversation. I, I love the energy that Chris brought to this subject and the optimism as well. Yeah, and I think he's a good ambassador for sustainable population advocacy. And, and that's so important because I think that's a big part of the purpose of this podcast is to uh, hopefully we model for activists out there uh, some good ways to talk about the subject. But for the most part, that's what we're all doing. We're all trying to figure out, we're trying to make sure that we're knowledgeable about it and that we can speak well about it. And of course, also make sure that couples around the world get this information so they can make informed family-sized decisions. I really like the part of the conversation about uh, the population taboo, the fact that Chris, you know, labeled it an uncomfortable conversation, but that he would, when confronted with that by someone he was speaking to, that he would say, well, yeah, it is an uncomfortable conversation, but which would you rather have? Would you rather have this slightly uncomfortable conversation? We could call it, I, I would say, 
editorializing here, we could call it an, an, another inconvenient truth. Or we could have a really uncomfortable conversation, which I assume he means about the end of human civilization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I appreciated the emphasis he brought you know, on strategy like you spoke, Dave. Uh, it's important to understand the cultural context we're working within, who we're speaking to about this, and what approach to bring to make the conversation accessible. Like he said, it's uncomfortable for so many different reasons. He spoke about sex politics and religion surrounding this very topic. And you can see for many different cultures, the spectrum on discomfort lies somewhere in between, uh, anywhere from the left to the right. So, you know, I've noticed even in my own conversations, for example, uh, I'm very interested in animal advocacy. And when I'm speaking to the animal advocacy groups, I bring the conversation of overpopulation from the perspective of how it's impacting animals. Sure. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, it was kind of neat how he talked about people kind of start to get depressed. He's talking about potentially destroying the planet. But then he shares with them the good news. He says he mentions Rosie the Riveter and that changes the tone of the room. And he goes into women's empowerment and access to family planning technologies. And he always gets a pretty positive reception to that. But that made me think, oh, is he another one of these people who's going to advise us, don't talk about overpopulation? Because people don't want to talk about it, just talk about women's empowerment. You know, the end is the same. So avoid the uncomfortable subject and we'll get there by beating around the bush. And as you probably know, if you've listened to more than, uh, you know, 10 minutes of any episode of the Overpopulation Podcast, I hate beating around the bush. Uh, I think this is adult swim. I think we need to confront the uh, issue, but we do need to find good ways to approach the subject with other people. So I really liked his answer, which was, this isn't a code word and a way to beat around the bush that we do need to include in the conversation, the subject of, as he calls it, runaway population growth. Yeah, I really appreciated that too. And the fact that not talking about overpopulation in this context is actually getting in the way of real empowerment. And it can, you know, in itself be a violation of of rights, because when we start hiding behind words, then, you know, like we spoke about in the podcast, what happened with the Cairo conference, a lot of aid gets redirected to a different cause rather than addressing family planning and addressing overpopulation. You know, this isn't the first time you've mentioned that. I think this is really an interesting perspective you're bringing to the table. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts on that in future episodes. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, let's talk about uh, the word overpopulation, because I had heard Chris say on another podcast that uh, he really doesn't like the word, you know, avoid the word. And so I confronted him on that in this conversation, and I liked his answer, too. What did you think of his answer? Very specific to his context. I liked that, you know, for different people, different words make sense. And he doesn't shy away from talking about population. He uses the word runaway population growth. Uh, But I think in essence, he is talking about the same thing. And if he is having better luck with his message landing with the audience he's working with, then great. But that raises an interesting subject that I think is worth us diving in a little bit to here, and that is, well, do we take a lesson from that? Does that mean that we should reevaluate how we talk about the subject here? World Population Balance made a conscious decision several years ago, more than six years ago, I know that, to uh, start using the word overpopulation. It wasn't used very much. And our sense is it's really important to use that word because there was so much conversation about population growth and stopping population growth. And even today, I know you hear it, see it, read it all the time about stabilizing human population. And when we are overpopulated, we are so far into overshoot that globally we're almost at two planet living today. Stopping population growth doesn't solve the problem. That's right. You know, we need people to recognize that we went too far, Yeah. that we need to contract the population. And so overpopulation does the trick there, I think. I like the word. It defines what it really is. We are overpopulation. And even as his book defines it, 
if he's recommending 3 billion to be the optimal population and we're at, you know, 7.8, we are grossly overpopulated. And I don't have an issue using that word. So maybe when he speaks in front of a group, uh, people are going to rush him at the end and ask for his autograph and give him hugs and kisses. And when you or I do that, we might not get that because we're going to use that word. (laughs) Darn. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe if we use the word in a really nice way. I'm I'm going to challenge you to, uh, that's your assignment. (laughs) Show us the way. Now, one of one of my biggest pet peeves we got into also, which is people trying to silence the population debate because they say, well, that takes the focus off of overconsumption. And I was really glad that he latched onto that quickly. He knew exactly what that issue was and has, a, has an issue with it, just like we do. No, I, I completely agree. I appreciate it. He's not posing it as a debate. It's not overconsumption versus overpopulation. We have spoken about this. At length, if you missed an episode, we we did a deep dive in podcast 54 uh, on this. Thanks for the reminder. Seems like we talk about it time and time again. But uh, yeah, I completely agree. It's uh, especially the point, you know, about the growing middle class and all of the developing countries. It's not really a matter of competing for attention. Yeah. When you think about it, you got a population of India approaching one and a half billion, population of China about one and a half billion. There's three billion people right there who are in the midst of uh, improving their lifestyles. And I don't think anybody wants to tell them, no, you need to remain poor. And the simple fact is that you can't take those three billion people and convert them into North American style over consumers. Planet isn't going to accept that for... You can't have 24 hours of that, I don't think. Exactly. Yeah, and most scientists would agree, I think. But Chris gave us a really great, I think this is a great uh, tool to put in our toolbox, and this is something you can say to somebody who challenges you about that overconsumption. Uh, And what he said was, he will just ask the person, does a family of nine in your country consume more or less than a family of two? A good reminder. There you go. There you go. Glad to see that his assessment of the progress that we're making in this crusade to overcome, to diminish the population taboo. He sees signs of progress, as do I. Mm -hmm. So I was glad to get some validation of that. Yeah, I agree. I really just, I enjoyed his optimism overall around the whole subject. Yeah. And I'm frequently not that optimistic. Like I have a bone to pick with some optimists, but I think he's got the right kind of optimism. Oh, also good words uh, when he described what happens if and when we do hit 9 billion. You know, we're at 7.8 7.8 billion today, and uh, it's almost a fait accompli that we're going to hit 9 billion. It's not totally baked into the cake, but with each day that we wait, we're getting closer to that being unavoidable. And uh, his description will be in such ecological depth that size, frequency, and probability of very bad things that kill lots and lots of people will go up. Thought that was well put. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, it's not something that will happen. It's something that has already happened. It's something that is happening now in terms of irreversible damage to our ecology, to all of the hundreds of thousands of species that, you know, are gone forever. There is huge resource scarcity already happening in so many of the countries. You, you look at the water crisis in you know, Africa and Asia and Southeast Asia. Those are all signs of the very climate catastrophe that he's talking about. Well, darn, that's a downer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where we're, that is, <clears throat> we're in the middle of heading there. That's for darn sure. Might want to take your foot off the accelerator pedal, huh? So I liked the fact that he, uh, I think he devoted a chapter of the book to uh, economists Mm -hmm. and maybe neoclassical economists in particular. So I was looking forward to at least the two of us and and probably the three of us uh, joining in uh, hoisting neoclassical economists up on their petards. But it was interesting. He sort of, for some reason, wanted to maybe deflect a little bit of the blame to journalists. And I thought that was interesting because I don't hear too many people sharing my consternation over the way these issues are reported in the media. Yeah, and uh, you rightfully mentioned the uh, growth-addicted philosophy that everyone has grown up with, and that's the premise of most of their conversations and their articles. 
But also it's not, I think we talked about it, it's not just benign stuff. This stuff has consequences in culture. It informs how people think, informs how governments think. And I think journalists are also very much picking up on conversations happening behind closed doors or not closed doors in, in you know, policymakers' uh, conversations around economic growth. You know, and I just thought of this. I think this episode's going to come out just in time. I actually, I've got to put a link in the show notes to the Intermountain Sustainability Summit because I am doing a presentation there on this journalism topic on March 18th. So look at, if you're listening to this episode, as soon as it gets published, it's not March 18th yet, or it's in the early in the morning, then look in the show notes, get a link and register for the day. It's really quite inexpensive. And you'll get to uh, hear my presentation about what I think it is that keeps this growth imperative entrenched in our culture. And it's really all about the journalism, the stories that we're telling around the campfire. Oh, that's great. I, I look forward to attending that. Great. Yes, and I also wanted to add a previous podcast, Jane O'Sullivan, when we had her, I think it was podcast 55, she does a really good job taking on this depopulation panic propaganda and the you know eternal obsession with GDP growth. Mm -hmm. And you know she uses the analogy of increasing the size of the pie for GDP growth. And by bringing in more people or having more people like you by using population growth and uh, also looking at what that's doing to the individual size of the pie, the size is reducing too. So the per capita GDP is not really going up. The quality of lives of people are not increasing by adding more people to the planet. Uh, it's quite the opposite, you can argue, too, because it's increasing the external costs of you know, increasing the population size. Yeah, and there's you probably there's not going to be enough ice cream to have your pie a la mode. Exactly. <laughs> I just felt the need to throw that in because apparently we have some hilarity in this podcast at times. And that gets, <laughs> so I'm not sure there's enough hilarity this time. <laughs> I think you bring. And I don't think I don't think I did the trick there with that either. I think you bring more of that than I do. We need better writers. <laughs> But, you know, I think close to last on my list is, I think, really kind of the headline, which is his 2030 plan. I think this could be something we'll be talking about a lot in the future. What did you think about that? Yeah, I mean, he made it sound quite simple and achievable, which was a breath of fresh air. You know, he talks about lowering the curve or bending the curve from a fertility of 2.45 to an average fertility of 1.5 uh, mm -hmm. globally. And his plan is to have that achieved by 2030, which I think sounds incredible if we can do it. Yeah. And, you know, we're kind of getting used to having these, you know, shorter term goals. You know, the conversations around climate change are frequently now about where do we need to be by 2025 or 2030 or 2050. So I think that's really taking advantage of just the mindset that we're in today. And uh, as you know, uh, the solution to overpopulation is voluntary. We just need really good information around the world and maybe a little bit of inspiration. So I think a global campaign, at least a global conversation, some global goals, you know, would help us to go far. And I think the kind of the 2030 plan could be a, a good approach to that. You know, his, his goal is getting fertility down to one and a half, which is more realistic than what we've been talking about a lot lately is uh, one planet, one child is that if we could get down to a, a one child per family average that, you know, in less than 100 years, we'd be back to the three billion that he talks about in that book. Take a little bit longer at one and a half, but uh, I liked the way that he called it. Instead of, on average, choosing two to three kids, choosing one to two. Doesn't sound that hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wouldn't it be incredible if um, we do start seeing goals like that put into like UN Millennium Goals or SDGs. Dream on. Just say, you know, 1.5 is our goal for 2030. And imagine how that would normalize the conversation around family planning. I think not talking about it simply perpetuates the taboo, which it's not supposed to be. Yeah, we've been running away from it for uh, three decades. And I mean, that is, a you know, I hate to label it a pipe dream. It's It's hard to imagine the UN, you know, overcoming this, huge inertia of really over political correctness, mm -hmm. you know, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and really telling it like it is. Yeah. Saying, you know what, we're done beating around the bush. It's amazing what we could accomplish. Yeah. And also to his point of instead of choosing two to three, choosing one to two, I would also add, you know, the responsibility on those of us who actually have authentic choice to make that choice. You know, in a lot of countries, for a lot of people, that choice does not exist. Yeah. He spoke to that, you know, with our religion and patriarchy. The reproductive agency simply isn't there. And that's where the work in empowering women is going to help bring that liberation towards the movement. But then for those of us who have that choice here, I feel it's a responsibility to take that choice very seriously. It is. It gets such short shrift. It is just not really discussed except by us, the need to have women in the overdeveloped world, women and men, you know, fully informed about the human overpopulation crisis when they're making their family size decisions. And I can tell you that I, I live in a, uh, a fairly affluent neighborhood in my community. I married into it. And I cannot tell you how many young people I am running into in this part of town who are, they're definitely educated, they're definitely empowered, and they're definitely having three, four, five, six kids today. And I don't think they would be making those decisions if they were armed with all the facts about the future of those children. I agree. Yeah, yeah we really need to move the conversation away from overpopulation is a problem out there somewhere and not here. It very much is a problem here, you know. So I agree with you. We need to be addressing that issue, both of overconsumption and overpopulation, everywhere. Yeah. And what better way to uh, end this episode? That's it for this edition of the Overpopulation Podcast. Thanks, Dave, for your partnership on this episode and for caring about the future well-being of all life on Earth. Well, you're welcome and right back at you. Visit worldpopulationbalance.org to learn more about how we can end world overpopulation. At the website, you can sign the Sustainable Population Pledge, listen to all our podcasts, get on our email list. You can become a supporting member, make a donation to support our vital work. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Please write to us. We love hearing from you and we often share your thoughts on the podcast. You can write to us at podcast at worldpopulationbalance.org. You can also recommend this episode or the whole podcast to friends, family, colleagues, journalists, economists, and uh, elected representatives. And click subscribe or follow in your podcast app so you don't miss an episode. I'm on a roll still. I've got a quote to close this episode with. The goals we pursue are the seeds from which our future grows. Now, this came from Mike Nickerson, uh, a gentleman who I just have a, a lot of esteem for. And he's a fellow Canadian. Da, da, da. He lives in Ontario. He's not far, mm. not far from you. Uh, his name is Mike Nickerson. He wrote a great book called Life, Money, and Illusion. And he's a big proponent of the more fun, less stuff meme and founder of the Seventh Generation Initiative. I'll include a link or two in the show notes so that you can get better acquainted with Mike and his work. I couldn't agree with that, uh, the quote, more fun, less stuff. I am very much a minimalist. We live a very minimalist lifestyle. And uh, I cannot tell you how liberating it is to not have too many things and to not be driven by having more things. It truly is more fun. Yep. Well, you know what? I hear the cat here in my studio and I hear the dog in yours. It's definitely time to wrap this up, don't you think? Our little guys need us. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. So until next time, we're Nandita Bajaj and Dave Gardner reminding you that we know how to end overpopulation. Let's get on with it. 